All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Flory Ventures Web3 Climate Showcase. I'm Ryan Nesbitt, and I'm here with my fellow general partner, Tom Erbariak. Um, Flory Ventures, if you guys aren't familiar with us, is a leading global early stage investor in Web3 startups that are using blockchain technology to tackle some of the biggest problems of our time, financial inclusion and the climate crisis. Uh, many of you probably heard of the refi movement, you know, the blockchain projects uh, tackling climate, biodiversity, sustainable finance, um, but are probably a little light on the details of exactly what is being built and how it all fits together with the existing markets. So given the concurrent uh, COP meetings in Egypt right now, climate is really an important conversation in everyone's mind. We thought it would be um, the, the perfect time to put on this climate showcase and bring you some examples of companies that are, that are really uh, delivering um, on this promise. So um, this is not going to be a typical demo day event. We're not going to run a uh, cold pitch company after company after company. Um, instead, you're going to hear from 15 founders of some of the leading companies um, tackling climate crisis. We've organized the event into five different panels where founders and an all-star roster of guest moderators who walk you through the various aspects of the value chain using their projects as examples of the Im impactful work that is being done. We'll start with a high level conversation around uh, blockchain and climate, then dive deeper into project development, data and new ways of measuring, reporting and verifying climate impact, innovations in climate finance, and finally, how blockchain is being used to address demand, transfer and retirement of climate assets. All right, before we get started, a couple of housekeeping things, quick note on the logistics, um, especially for those of you who are new to Stonks events and Stonks is is evolving and building as well. So if you've been to a Stonks event, it may look a little different than you're used to. Um, our goal for this event is, is basically for, for you, the audience, to make connections um, with our founders who like all founders are fundraising, hiring, looking for customers and partners and just really uh, broadening their network. So. Um, each founder at the beginning of their panel will briefly introduce themselves. During that time, you'll see a profile of their company below the screen. Um, there's a button in there where you can request to connect with the founder. Use it. This is an easy way. You just click. There's not you know, no commitments. You can just say, hey, I love what you're doing. would love to connect. Uh, doesn't matter what you're interested in, if you're interested in a job, if you're interested in investing, et cetera, use that button. Um, don't worry if you're slow on the buzzer during because it's just short introductions. If you're slow on the buzzer, up on the top left of your screen, you'll see a menu with all the companies that are participating in the panels or in the in the entire showcase today. And at any point during the showcase, you can you can click through there, look at the companies' profiles, uh, make a connection request, check out check out their deck, check out more information, etc. Um, feel free to kind of be navigating through there during during the event as well. Um, you also see a chat on the right side of the screen. Um, uh, jump in with questions, words of encouragement, just keep it lively, keep it fun for for uh, for the event. And we'll try to weave in some of the questions that you ask uh, for the panels if, if time allows. Um, all right, I'm gonna hand you off to uh, Tom right now, who's going to uh, MC for the rest of the event and we'll get the first panel up. Thanks again. <clears throat> Thank you, Ryan, for the warm introduction. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Tom here from Florida Ventures. We're going to start with our first panel, the Voluntary Carbon Market and Blockchain, moderated by Anna Lerner, uh, which I'm super excited about. Anna has deep expertise across the full uh, climate finance value chain, from development projects in Sub-Saharan Africa to large-scale climate mitigation finance at the World Bank. Most recently, she worked at Meta, leading their strategic partnership uh, focused on the UN Sustainability Goals. She is currently the CEO of the Climate Collective, which is a close organization to us, to us a leading coalition of stakeholders leveraging trusted, sustainable Web3 infrastructure to unlock innovative and verifiable climate actions. Um, from me to you, Anna, and to the rest. Thank you, Tom. I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, with a super exciting panel. Um, so to get us started, we are going to uh, be efficient with time. Uh, climate change is the single greatest challenge facing humanity today. I think we all know this. Economists have described this as a collective action issue or collective action failure. Um, at the Climate Collective, we would like to think of it as a mass coordination problem that blockchain could significantly help resolve. Um, to get us started, I wanted to share a couple of relevant numbers. Uh, $632 billion is the size of climate finance in 2019-2020. Out of this, a vast majority went to climate change mitigation projects and projects in the global north. 
to meet our climate targets, it needs to be increased by about 600% to over $4 trillion per year and channel more funding to the global south. A significant part of this increase needs to come from the private sector. While vastly imperfect, the voluntary carbon market is a readily available instrument to channel that increase in private sector contributions. In 2021, the voluntary carbon market sat at roughly $2 billion of traded assets, and we expect it to multiply by 7, 8, 9 X in 2023 and by almost 100 X in 2030. So let's now turn to the companies working to meet this massive market opportunity. Um, I'm going to ask Jeff from Circular, Circular Impact, Joe from Thalo, and Frederick from Green Trade Impact introduce uh, themselves and their companies. Awesome. Well, excited to kick this off. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Jeff, and I am the co-founder of Circular Impact. Circular Impact is building the Web3 platform for circular economy companies to quantify and monetize their impact. We're starting with carbon credits, but also working toward impact beyond carbon in regenerative finance. Circular economy models can be a uniquely scalable form of carbon avoidance because the more waste you process, the more carbon is avoided. While we believe the current focus on nature-based assets for carbon avoidance and sequestration is important, we also believe carbon markets are missing the opportunity to leverage circular economy models and their technology-based solutions in the climate fight. Amazing. Joe. Thanks, guys. Hi, my name's Joe. I'm co-founder and chief strategy officer at Thalo. At Thalo, our KPI is impact, and we believe to create impact, you need scale. That's why we're building out the Web3 infrastructure to facilitate institutional level regenerative finance. Our flagship product, the Thalo Carbon Exchange, is a registry-friendly, developer-focused exchange that will enable the transparent, traceable, and highly liquid trading and retirement of carbon credits on-chain. To facilitate this, we've recently built the world's first and only two-way bridge with a carbon registry. We're aiming for this to become the blueprint for bridging, but not just nature-based assets, in fact, all real-world assets. This can unlock stablecoin and treasury collateralization like we've never seen before, unlocking hundreds of millions, if not billions, for nature. We've just closed our seed round and are gearing up for Series A, so we'd love to chat to partners and investors. Brilliant. Thanks, Joe. All right, Frederick, you're last. Hi, I'm Frederick, uh, co-founder and uh, CEO from Green Trade. Green Trade is a platform building the infrastructure for forward financing of nature-based carbon credits. We are working with project developers, digitize their future carbon credits and make them available for corporate buyers and uh, investors today. We recently raised our pre-seed round looking to raise additional funding. If you're a corporate buyer having a net zero commitment or if you are an investor, I would love to speak to you. But now, thanks to Flory and to, to the host, Anna, to uh, looking forward to the panel. Fantastic. Okay, so we have Circular Impact working on the next generation digital environmental assets, Thalo revolutionizing infrastructure, two-way bridging for carbon credits, and Green Trade Impact focused on early stage of the value chain expanding project finance. Um, super, super exciting. Um, my first question to the panelists, I would love for Joe and maybe Frederick to address this. I know there are many challenges and problems with the voluntary carbon market, but name one of the problems that you're really focused on and how you're working to solve that. Thanks, Anna. Um, great question. Like, uh, I can um, reflect what you're saying there. There are tons of issues in the VCM in its current form, and Thalo actually released a report on this that I'll, I'll drop in the comment box after. But what Thalo is particularly committed to improving is the market for developers. We believe uh, project developers get a bit of a rum deal at the minute in the current marketplace. There's no price transparency. They don't benefit from the secondary market at all. And there's limited direct market access. That's why we're building the infrastructure to democratize and demystify the markets by ensuring price data is available, remo removing the value sapping intermediaries, and also unlocking inciting, exciting new income streams through initiatives like royalties for developers that get essentially get kickbacks for every secondary trade on the marketplace? Um, in my view, it's quite simple. It's transparency and access to capital for project developers. Uh, transparency is an overall issue, but especially when it comes to the um, share that project developers get 
um, through the sale of uh, carbon credits that are generated and later on sold. And secondly, in my view, access to capital. This is something we at Green Trade are focusing on. We're working with project developers on new projects, digitize their future carbon credits and make them available to corporate buyers and investors. We believe that forward financing is critical to get new projects off the ground and uh, to scale high quality carbon supply. Yes, fantastic. Let's, let's take a minute to just lift the importance of high quality supply. Um, what is the definition to you all of high quality supply? Frederick, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, at Green Trade, our de definition is related to the impact of the project and the associated credit with a focus on transparency, additionality, permanence, and integrity that our improved MRV has enabled. Awesome. Joe? Yeah, I'd like to reflect what Frederick said then, but also to add that capital flows to nature at the speed of trust, something I heard recently, and I think it, it really resonated with us. And we need speed, and that's why we've been working with the registries who spent the last two decades building that trust and refining their methodologies. Now, that's not to say the re registries are perfect, they're not, but they do provide a base layer of security for corporates and finance, financial institutions to participate in the market. Uh, but we're also working with uh, rating agencies alongside them to ensure that there's quality transparency throughout the buying and trading process. Great. Jeff, I'd love to hear from you because you're doing a, sort of a new version of impact credits. How does this relate to high quality uh, and your engagement with registries? Yeah, I think, um, you know, our, our view on high quality supply, I think, goes beyond the narrow focus of carbon. So I think circular economy companies contribute to decarbonization, but um, often in more sort of circular and sustainable ways than just the avoidance of CO2 emissions. That's great. That's super interesting. I like to think about these sort of next generation digital environmental assets, which I think is a broader term and could encompass all kinds of high quality environmental or biodiversity benefits, even social um, and human benefits at some point. Sure. Um, so, Jeff, now that nations globally will have to start reporting on their own net zero goals or the NDCs, as it's called in the in the COP negotiations, what do you think this means for more diverse impact credits looking beyond carbon? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think a good way to answer that is just to take an example. Right. So currently, Circular Impact is working with an urban slum waste management company um, based out in East Africa. Um, their business model is that they upcycle organic waste from areas that lack central sewer systems. So in that process, they're avoiding the release of methane gas, which is the carbon impact, but they're also improving public health, contributing to a cleaner water supply, and combating biodiversity loss. Um, and the question we have is, how do we as a society value this impact beyond the carbon? Um, and I think that's why we're so excited because there's just so much work happening in the blockchain space right now to unlock impact credits beyond just carbon. That's fantastic. Okay, we're about five minutes left. So I think I'm going to squeeze in both of my last questions because we're being very efficient. Um, so first of all, um, rapid fire. Uh, but what do you think working, why do you think working with registries or existing players is so important to Web3 uh, as a sector? A free for all. Who wants to start? Here, I, I can I'll start. I'll start. Oh, oh go sorry. Go on. Go on, Joe. Go on, Joe. Um, I'm all for improving uh, the markets, and the registries do need improvement. But I think we need to be very cautious about reconstructing. There's a couple of points that we need to consider. Firstly, how much time we have to scale the markets and have impact. It's not very long. I'm pretty sure everyone knows this. But then also, there's the fragmentation point with too many different approaches and different market actors, it's making it increasingly difficult for corporates to know what to buy. And ultimately, they just end up saying, no, this is too high risk. So uh, in my opinion, blockchain and Web3 should be additive to the legacy carbon markets. Um, and that's why it's important that we work with uh, incumbents to support their transformation rather than rebuild from the ground up. Great. Jeff, thoughts on that? Yeah, I think in our case, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so if you look at the existing registries, there are just limited carbon accounting methodologies that fit the circular economy sector that we're operating in. So I think a way forward for the industry will have to include working with registries to help them expand sort of their scope of methodologies, but also in parallel build a next generation infrastructure purpose built for the circular economy. That's great. Frederick. 
I believe working with the registries is one way of doing it. At the same time, in order to meet the um, Paris the goals of the Paris Agreement, I believe it really needs a revamp, fostering speed, transparency, decentra decentralization, interoperability, integrity, and easy access. And this is why I believe a blockchain-based environment is a great technology facilitator to drive that change and um, yeah, and to um, drive speed. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have a lot of time left. I think that's that's really accurate. Um, okay, last question. Um, wrapping up, the voluntary carbon market is expected to sevenfold at least in 2023 and scale up to over 100x by 2030. How are you positioning yourself to support that growth and scale your business? Maybe we start reverse order. Frederick, you can go first. Yeah, so I think new high high quality carbon or CO two projects are really key. Um, so in our case, we stick to our approach by building the infrastructure for forward financing. We believe working with project developers, digitizing their future carbon credits, and making them available for corporate buyers, investors today, that is in line. And our mission is to create an additional supply uh, of around one billion tons by of CO two credits by twenty thirty. And if we manage to hear that hit that, I think our contribution to the market growth will be significant. Jeff, sorry, that was really great. Thanks, Frederick. Yeah, so uh, I think really simply, I think, you know, everyone is focused on nature based assets, which is hyper critical, and hyper important. But I think there's just a huge unmet need in sort of the circular economy and sort of technology based processes that are yet to be tapped. Yes. Yeah, for, from our perspective, um, we're focusing on institutional level regenerative finance. We need tokenized carbon at scale, but alongside the appropriate safeguards to ensure financial integrity, regulatory compliance and consumer protection. I think once we've got those in place, then we're able to scale to the levels that um, were well, the ambitions that we've all got as a, as a collective. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you all so much. Uh, I've learned a lot working with you across the last couple of days um, and really look forward to seeing all your businesses scale. I think what you're working on is incredibly important and really, really needed for speed, scale and impact. Thanks a lot, Anna. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Anna. Thanks, guys. Now here we go. Thank you very much, everybody. It was a great beginning. Um, coming up next, we have the second panel of project development led by Team Ran. Team is the managing partner of uh, Mercy Call Ventures. It's an early stage impact VC that we work with quite a lot. Uh, they're backing startups that are increasing the resilience of underserved individuals and communities in emerging markets. Tim brings with him experience of uh, 15 years as a founder, as an operator, as a fund manager across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Um, he brings with him an extensive experience in agritech, Web3, climate finance, and climate tech. He sits on the board of multiple uh, Mercico uh, venture portfolio companies and is an advisor to Goldfinch, uh, MyTeli, and Impoa. Um, Tim is based in Panama, is also a great friend, I have to say. Uh, so, Tim, I'll let you have it from here. Thanks, Tom, for the kind introduction. Really wonderful to be here. Um, excited to dig into project development. Um, you know, as Anna just said, we're looking at the potential to uh, scale this this whole industry 100x over the coming decade. Uh, but there's a ton of infrastructure that uh, needs to be built uh, for that to be possible. And excited to have all the companies here today uh, as part of that kind of initiative. Um, you know, as, as has been mentioned with past panel, one of the biggest issues we face is really supply crunch across all ecosystem credit classes uh, beyond just carbon. <coughs> so equalizing access to this market uh, for all project developers of all sizes and levels of technical sophistication is really critical. Um, as Jeff mentioned in the past panel, a lot has been focused on nature-based solutions, which is you know, critical as one quiver in the toolkit. Um, and just on that alone, we really need to look at bringing 350 million hectares uh, online over the coming decade to hit two, two degree uh, Celsius increase in temperature and limit it there. Uh, last year, we were net negative 8 million. Uh, so we're really driving in reverse. So to give you a sense of the urgency and the market opportunity, uh, empowering project de developers is be crucial. And excited today to have Eduardo, Jose, and Tyler here, who are really at the forefront of doing that in different ways. 
Um, so I'm going to do kind of a round robin. Uh, maybe Eduardo, you could uh, jump in first. Yes, thank you. I am Eduardo Spina. I am the CEO and co-founder of Energy, a centralized platform for financing clean energy projects in Latin America. Today, we need more than $2.4 trillion to avoid a climate disaster in sustainability investments. And Latin America has become one of the fastest growing markets in solar energy. But we are investing no more than 1% of the money that we need to avoid that climate disaster as humanity with a lot of projects needing funding and a lot of liquidity and a lack of liquidity for those projects that is why we created energy as a decentralized platform to finance that projects from retail or institutional investors who invest in that projects buying the uwat a fully collateralized uh, token uh, based in real watts in the real world that helps to finance that project. Nowadays, Energy has helped to finance $5 million with more than 1,000 retail investors. And we have helped to finance uh, more than 25 projects. Fantastic. Uh, Jose, feel free to jump in next. Hi, everyone. My name is Jose. I'm the CEO of Color. Um, Color is based in Chile, where half of Patagonia is on sale. Um, at a deforestation rate of one acre per minute. Uh, probably you don't know this, but Patagonia is an awesome carbon sink, uh, absorbing up to three times more than the Amazon. Uh, and that makes Patagonia not only one of the most beautiful places in the world, but also one of the most efficient ones. So what is our solution for doing that? Uh, we are opening access to everyone everywhere to conservation, selling a token of Patagonia. So. Uh, Boston Consulting Group is saying that this new asset class market is going to be a trillion by the next two years, by, by the next 10 years. And also Morgan Stanley is saying that the carbon market is going to have the same magnitude. So last week we opened a pre-sale uh, and we start selling an, an acre per hour mostly. So let's open access to everyone everywhere to conservation. Thanks. Thanks. And last but not least, Tyler. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for being here. We're thrilled. Um, I'm Tyler Crabtree, I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Carbon Path. At Carbon Path, um, what we've created is a Web3 registry and also a carbon prevention token built on the Celo blockchain. The goal of our token is to incentivize the shutdown of the world's most polluting oil and gas wells. Right now in the United States alone, there are 2.75 million wells that are low producing, orphaned or abandoned, um, and many more globally. If we can tackle these and incentivize their proper and safe shutdown, we will save over 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide and over 20 million tons of methane, fugitive emissions from leaking directly into the atmosphere. Right now, um, we are completed to a two well project in Montana for this year, and we're focused on doing 100 wells in 2023 and growing to 1,000 wells in 2024 um, and beyond. We feel we've got a really scalable solution that's highly impactful, um, and we look forward to sharing that with you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. So I, I guess really fundamental question, um, and maybe Jose, we could start with you. Um, you know, where does blockchain fit in? Like, why is this relevant for project developers? Uh, I would say that uh, it's interesting for project developments because um, let's imagine that uh, right now we have a ton of land here in Patagonia that is available and, and not necessarily we're, we're going to find the, the right market here. So we have to open uh, through a different uh, instrument or a different technology, the capacity to everywhere, uh, from everywhere and everyone can access to this. We think that, that the blockchain uh, is an awesome uh, platform for doing that, uh, not only for the transparency that a lot of these projects needs, because I think that that's, that's also an issue uh, with most of the carbon projects that uh, you don't know what's going on there. So the blockchain also not only, not only provides a ledger of transparency about what you're uh, investing in, but also is creating the capacity to open access to liquidity from everywhere in the world. So you're talking about uh, projects like us in Chile, but also in Indonesia, right? So um, I feel like that's why blockchain could could create a, could, could be a game changer in this space. Great, and Wadro, on a similar note, I mean, project financing for renewables and solar has been around for decades, right? Where do you feel like Web3 kind of adds advantages for you, for your stakeholders, you know, namely project developers? Yeah, of course, uh, financing renewable energy is not new <laughs> for everyone, but I think that 
today the world is investing, but not, is not investing a lot. We need to invest more. And I think that blockchain help us in, in two ways, in financing more money, but also from retail investors and from worldwide. So I think if we put more money together, uh, we could hit that $2.4 trillion that we need today as humanity for avoiding that climate disaster. Great. And just if you go a little bit more deeply, like how, yeah, how are you looking at aggregating that kind of liquidity and driving more money? Maybe you could talk a little bit more about Unergy and yeah, what you're kind of doing different compared to what happens now. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, for example, in Latin America, uh, we have a lot of projects and we have little projects that are worth like 500 K for example, uh, uh, sorry, five, uh, 50 K. And we have big projects that are the most interesting projects for big companies. So some companies are more focused in the big projects, but uh, there are a lot of little projects or medium sized projects that are needing more liquidity. And we are helping to finance that kind of projects with, uh, with money from a retail investor or institutional investors that are buying our token right now. Wonderful. Thank you. Tyler, I wanted to kind of move into like, because I think you're in a really interesting space, right, compared to the other panelists and maybe other companies here today. Um, you know, what have been some of the big barriers uh, that are faced by project developers uh, to bring new supply online? Like, and how are you guys looking at addressing some of those pain points? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tim. Um, for us, it's we feel that we've got a really big supply of projects and we can bring a lot of scale to the market. Um, as I mentioned, there's you know 2.75 million wells in the United States alone that fit our methodologies. We've got two, one for the low producing wells and one for the orphan and abandoned wells. For us, it's really generating the enthusiasm and interest in our type of project. The world is very familiar with renewable energy that Eduardo is working on and some of the nature-based solutions that Jose is working on, which I think are both really noble and awesome efforts. Um, but for us, the word, it really isn't out there. For us, it's really communication um getting enthusiasm around our methodologies one of our methodologies in the orphan and abandoned well side uh, is similar to a one of one from the existing registries um acr has one on, on the orphan and abandoned well side but on the marginal well side we're the pioneers we've written our own methodology we've written it in accordance with icro standards we've generated some academic support behind it um but we do hit that roadblock it's easy for a corporate buyer to say well you're not vera you're not a vera uh, methodology so we're not going to get excited about it um, one of the reasons we love blockchain is that it's the, you can access the individual. So you're not reliant necessarily on that corporate market. And you can, you can essentially use, use the Web3 community as a supportive community to access the individual and allow individuals to make their own choice. Um, we, put, we put every piece of evidence of every single well that we're shutting in and every ton of carbon and every ton of methane that we're locking away onto the blockchain to make it as transparent as possible. And we have independent verification, third party verification built into our methodologies. Um, so that's really it. Getting the word out is our, is our biggest hurdle, Tim. Right. Fantastic. Um, Jose, I mean, just building upon, I think, trust and transparency. Um, yeah. Tell me more about the pain points, you know, again, and kind of the existing system uh, that you feel like uh, you can overcome uh, using blockchain. Like what, what, what allows you to build that trust and transparency with potential buyers down the road, as well as project developers and other stakeholders? Okay, yes. So, so basically uh, what, what we're talking here in, in, in terms of uh, conservation, we're talking about like we, we are conserving a piece of land and then it's going to provide some yields, right? Those yields is not that somebody's leasing or renting, but also what is the capacity of carbon credits that we can uh, take from that land, right? Uh, somebody needs to verify those, those carbon credits. Uh, and that there is different companies that do that. But I feel like that the most in, in, important way is to prove additionality, right? And, and what means additionality? It means that uh, you, you, have, um, you, you have a place that, that you are conserving something uh, due to the incentive of the carbon credit. And you need to demonstrate that. So you need to be in a jurisdiction that, that makes sense. Uh, that has everything in place. So you have to have the communities involved and you need to, uh, and, and all, all this information, all this information, uh, the blockchain provides a, a layer of transparency that you can have the titles there. So you can have uh, all the transaction, how the community is involved 
if you are paying something, what is the price that you got the land, right? Uh, is this a national park that somebody's selling for you, or this is a, a private land that somebody, and you have the title registry. So uh, in, in, in the way that we are uh, doing this, uh, we are adding all that information in, 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 in the blockchain. So for everyone, everyone in the world can see that, and, and nobody can, can skip that information or, 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 or avoid, you know? So. Fantastic. And I guess, you know, this is open to anybody, but, you know, regenerative finance, kind of the Web3 climate intersection is, is quite early, right? We're, we're all kind of collectively building all this infrastructure that should, should be mutually reinforcing and create this flywheel. But if, if all of you are wildly successful in what you're doing, I mean, what's, what's this market look like 10 years from now? Um, like, how do you feel like things have evolved and how is, you know, Web3 played a unique role in that versus, you know, the trajectory we currently have? I, I think maybe today we are in the 1998 to 2000 of internet in terms of Web3. So maybe in 10 years, uh, Web3 companies or Web3 startups that today are trying to do the best uh, are going to be the, the, the first companies and the best companies in the world. I think that we're in a very huge opportunity today to develop in Web3 and to, to start to democratize and decentralize everything i i think the web3 community and some of the prior panelists have a, have a huge opportunity to create first the transparency and the quality of the credits that that project developers like eduardo jose and ourselves are, are encouraging and developing but also establishing the marketplaces right they're the carbon market you've got the european regulated market california's got their own thing some countries here and there have their own but there's no there's no global standard around it or community around it and so i think web3 has the opportunity to really provide um provide markets and provide transparency in markets and provide price discovery so that people um, like ourselves on the project development side can really understand and know where they can get access to money what that's going to cost on a per ton basis and be able to execute really good projects for the world um you know like elvis presley says a little less conversation a little more action it's time to go um so we're all working on this together. We love it. Yes, um, as Eduardo and Tyler said, um, uh, the, the, the Web3 is providing an awesome opportunity here. And, and this is not something that I'm saying. It's, it's also been said by Boston Consulting Group, like a couple of trillions are going to be in this new asset class. Uh, Morgan Stanley saying that a couple of trillions are going to be by 2030 in, in the carbon market, right, on chain. So um, we need to... We need to start working on that because it's coming. So there's not enough, um, uh, the, the technology of the Web2 is not able to absorb the, the, the demand that the, that the climate uh, needs from companies or from individuals are, are gonna need for the next 10 years. So, so uh, this is the opportunity blockchain is providing is, is providing for us and, and we're working on that. So I feel like uh, right now is the right time to start uh, moving all those uh, uh, efforts uh, to, to, to this technology. Wonderful. Um, I think one last question in the two minutes we have left here. Um, you know, maybe just a quick round round of the table. I mean, what are the most interesting projects you're seeing on the market? Um, what do you think is the next frontier of projects that could come into you know what you're doing? Today in solar energy or clean energy is on grid solar energy projects for generating energy for the grid and for the future green hydrogen, green ammonia, and a nu nuclear energy. Great, and Tyler, this is your core business, but yeah, curious if there's anything in particular you're bullish on. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, we 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 love what we're doing since it's sort of pioneering <laughs> in the space, but um, of course, but. I love people to embrace that one first, but I think there's there's a lot of, of industrial solutions that could benefit from this um, down the path. I feel like in, industrial solutions haven't gotten the same recognition as um, as renewables and nature based solutions have. Um, people have flocked to those pretty pretty readily. But on the industrial side, you know, carbon capture and storage is a big one. Um, a lot of the new direct air capture, some of the other things that are pulling things out of this that are that are on the carbon removal side could be beneficial as well um, from the Web three community. In my opinion, the most interesting 
things are happening on the verification side and also on the carbon marketplace. So we want to focus on the quality suppliers. Uh, we want to imitate what is going on right now in real estate. Like you can buy a house by tokens. Uh, we're trying to do the same with land, with quality land uh, that we can save, conserve, and then take the benefits of those carbons. Great, thanks. Well, thanks to all for uh, joining today and what you're building, uh, filling a really critical gap on what we're trying to create. So look forward to handing it back over to Tomer. Thank you. Thank you, team. And thank you, the rest of the, the rest of the team coming with it. Um, excited all over the place. And I think this, this panel comes very well with the panel that we have next, which is our DMOV panel that is going to be moderated by Hara. Hera. That is a perfect fit here because Hera Wang is the principal of the Rocky Mountain Institute and the leader of the uh, RMI uh, Carbon Market Initiative, which leveraged data and technology enablement to accelerate trust, transparency, and differentiation in the voluntary carbon markets. Uh, she came from the world of carbon markets after spending six years in the climate tech ventures community, and she co-founded and led, led Third Derivative, a global startup accelerator with a strong focus on climate hard tech. Prior to that, uh, she was a VC investor and led businesses development at a battery startup. Hera started a career as a consultant at McKinsey and & Company and uh, had an academic training at Atmospheric Energy Engineering and Chemical Engineering. Uh, I will add it from here to you, Hera. Thank you so much, Tomer. I'm really excited to be here um, to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is MRV. And um, for those folks who are a little less familiar, MRV or measurement reporting and verification is what makes the claims around carbon reduction and carbon removals real. Um, I'm going to steal this from a friend who I heard it from, but there's actually a very blockchain way of explaining MRV. MRV can be seen as a proof of work for carbon credit transactions. So through MRVs, suppliers can prove that they've done the work to reduce and remove carbon. And in carbon markets, most buyers, they don't have the full understanding of the science and technologies behind how the carbon flows through our natural atmospheric and engineer system. So they rely on MRV to tell them what is going on with the carbon. So if this is the framework we bring to this panel. There's almost a perfect marriage between blockchain and MRV. So I would love to turn to the innovators in the space who are making it happen. And I'll have Miles, Luis, and Raviv introduce themselves. Wonderful, thank you. I appreciate you having me and thanks for, to Flory for throwing this on. My name is Miles Austin, I'm the CEO at Hyphen. Uh, at Hyphen, we provide automated systems for near real-time GHG data collection, aggregation, standardization, validation, and most importantly, dynamic distribution through a decentralized Oracle network. We achieve this through collaboration with the World Meteorological Organization's partner atmospheric agencies such as NOAA, ICOS, Copernicus, and NASA, where we rigorously collect tamper-proof GHG data in order to support various organizations with validated data to improve their validation methods of environmental claims through digital MRV. Um, we really do this to support carbon trading markets, but it, it goes beyond that for climate accounting, physical and transition risk analysis, modeling and forecasting. So we're really here to empower everybody in Web3 and anyone working on DMRV with real-time validated data. Thank you so much, Miles. That's fantastic. Luis, you're up next. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for putting the event together for you folks. Uh, I'm Luis, CEO and founder of Moss. Uh, Moss is a one-stop shop for uh, carbon offset services uh, based in Brazil and focused on the conservation of the Amazon forest. Uh, we have developed a system that we call Moss Forest that integrates um, public databases from the Brazilian government for uh, the analysis of deeds of property or property deeds, sorry. Uh, and with that analysis uh, to uh, lead to what we believe is a much safer, much stronger um, analysis of the permanence of those carbon credits. And we uh, ally that we join that analysis of the property rights with um, uh, satellite imaging 
uh, and carbon maps um, to also analyze uh, the environmental integrity of, of those credits. So we are uh, basically uh, attempting or digitizing uh, as much of uh, the data for uh, the generation of um, uh, or the issuance of carbon credits following the main uh, RED plus methodologies. Uh, and very glad to be here today. Uh, thank you so much. Awesome. Ravi, go ahead. Hello, Hara. We meet again. Uh, excited to be here. I'm Raviv. I'm co-founder of uh, Qubit, together with uh, my partner, Gig uh, Kaplan, who was uh, co-founder of Wix. I'm also a member of uh, the MRV Collective. And Qubit um, is a SaaS-enabled marketplace for ecosystem services. Um, we help food and agriculture companies connect, analyze, and publish impact data to their consumers, stakeholders, and regulators. Part of the work uh, we do also with the MRV Collective is building an open MRV protocol together with other MRV companies that are coming from uh, different backgrounds, different type of technologies such as um, eDNA, um, Internet of Things, drones, remote sensing. And the idea is really to bring some order and uh, trust and traceability to MRV data. I love that you said that MRV is like uh, proof of work. Uh, that, that resonates pretty well. So excited to be here. Thank you. Great. It's great to have this broad swath of representation here from each of you. Raviv, I'm going to start with you on this question. Um, can you just share with the audience how MRV happens today? Yes. Yeah, so of course, it depends on the space and uh, what we're looking to measure. <clears throat> so it really depends on the targets. Um, I think today MRV is mostly associated with carbon. However, we are starting to see MRV um, getting associated with nature-based solutions and measuring nature, not just carbon. So think about soil, think about water, think about biodiversity, plastics, pollutions. You can apply MRV to all of that. <clears throat> Specifically for carbon, uh, MRV is pretty kind of old school today. Uh, the, this is kind of starting to change with some digital MRV technologies. But for the vast majority, if we take Vera, for example, the biggest voluntary carbon market, uh, MRV is done by contracting with what's known as VVBs. Uh, these are the verification and validation bodies. I think Vera certified like 20 companies worldwide <clears throat> that are authorized to uh, measure, report, and verify carbon projects, which means that you need to contract with this company and then fly people around, depends on what you want to measure. Maybe you want to measure trees, maybe you want to measure soil, maybe you want to measure other things. <clears throat> you, have to wait, <clears throat> you have to wait for this um, company to generate a report. Um, and if you go and you do a search on Vera, you can see those kind of reports. Uh, they will make a nice uh, <clears throat> uh, book you know, on your coffee table. These are like 300 pages, long PDF, non-machine friendly type of reports. Uh, part of this is qualitative, part of this is quantitative research, <clears throat> where you have people basically reporting on the measurement. Um, and this is, again, this is just for carbon. <clears throat> Once we start talking about MRV for soil, for biodiversity, there is, of course, added complexity. But for the vast majority, MRV is done manually today by flying people all over. It's slow, it's expensive, it doesn't scale, and it tends to break because, um, you know, small farmers cannot afford <clears throat> those kind of MRV solutions, which means that we only get to MRV the big projects and we don't do it often enough. So if you go to Vera, you'll see some MRV reports are so three or five years old. We have no idea if the practice is still taking place, if the outcomes are still on the ground or not. So not very reliable at that point, but we are working to change that. <laughs> Great, Raviv. I think you've highlighted the problem of the market very well. And um, this is actually a perfect segue for me to turn to Miles. Uh, you're a self-proclaimed uh, climate data nerd, and you certainly have thought through a lot of these problems of data system being silos, siloed, um, not contextualized properly. Can you speak a little bit about the data problem you see in MRV and how your company is uh, building Web3 solutions to uh, to solve these problems. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a great question. It's an important one. So I think there's there's a few parts of it. The first one is really a latency issue. Um, and then there's an inoperability and dynamic uh, issue as well. Um, so when it comes to latency, a lot of the data that is made available to the public and private sectors today, primarily through the WMO's global sensory network of multiple atmospheric agencies, has this latency of a year and a half because there's a lot of manual processes. There's all these different agencies that act as silos. So by the time this is all grouped together, aggregated and standardized, and then given into the hands of all of these different innovators in the space, it puts everyone at a disadvantage because you're working with data that has this latency of a year and a half or two years old, and you're trying to use that to uh, price, measure, and model things today, right? So the first thing is really being able to speed that up and, and provide data in real time. So we that's sort of the core of what we do at Hyphen is uh, collecting all this data, providing it to everybody in preferred formats in near real time, um, ranging daily to quarterly, depends on the data sets. The, the second thing there beyond the latency is really the, um, the lack of like a, a standard, right? And so all of these different agencies do things slightly differently. There's not a lot of transparency to what's going on behind the scenes. So it's really important to create a data standard that can be used and agreed upon by everybody. And then making sure that this data is accessible in preferred formats, right? Uh, a Web3 company is going to want to see that in a very different format, preferably validated and on-chain and inoperable to be able to use on any chain um, versus a legacy system is going to want to see that in a different format. So it's important to equally empower everybody and give this in preferred formats. And the last thing I would sort of highlight on the, the problem of data is really not just, you know, making making sure that it's dynamic, right? So these databases internally in atmospheric agencies are constantly evolving and changing. And, um, and the reason for that is they'll find scientific studies today that changes the understanding. And so they'll go back, flag, alter, and update data in a historic database. So it's vital that anytime an alteration takes place, that that automatically refreshes to any other people down that value chain so that they're always having the most up-to-date data and that they're not constantly having to go back and double check it or unsure over the course of time if that data set is actually fractionalized and is no longer as accurate as it might have been the day they accessed it. Um, and so those are the, the three sort of main problems I see. And that, that's really what we decided to, to tackle at Hyphen was ensuring that we can provide this data in real time. It's always validated and tamper proof and it's completely dynamically accessible by any interested parties. Great. Awesome, Miles. I, that resonates very well um, to what we are seeing in the marketplace as well. Um, one other question, one other problem that Raviv have identified earlier is about um, not just the carbon benefit, but also the non-carbon benefit, but the biodiversity and uh, social rights benefits. Luis, I know that this is something that's very dear to your heart. Can you tell us a little more about the carbon and non-carbon benefits that's currently being measured in, um, in MOSS? Absolutely. So um, I think the way Ravi uh, explained the problem in terms of uh, the, how costs are very high for the data collection currently because it's all done personally and it's all done uh, presentially by auditors coming from the world over in the case of, or in our specific scope, in the case of Brazil, uh, you know, uh, we have Italian auditors coming in, you know, from Italy by plane to Sao Paulo and then by plane to Manaus and then by plane to wherever the project is. And of course, all of that um, could be uh, nowadays avoided uh, by the use of satellite imaging, but also by the use of big data. Uh, there are for example, currently biodiversity uh, maps that are uh, being updated um, almost on a on a daily basis, um, with you know all sorts of data on um, um, species that are uh, running the risk of extinction and that kind of stuff. Um, and these uh, biodiversity maps they are um, audited and um, 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 enforced, not enforced, recognized by uh, the local government. So they have a lot of uh, data feeds that are quite reliable uh, and that we could uh, just put on blockchain and have that information available in real time. And also 
uh, we are developing uh, an Uber-like app, sort of, uh, for the social um, uh, aspects to have local technical, uh, you know, surveyors or um, um, social uh, analysts of sorts um, to gather the data, to interview the communities, to see if the actual, you know, community benefit is being uh, done or not. And they upload the data uh, via apps and interviews, and it becomes almost real time. Or the, the recurrence of that data upload uh, becomes a lot more frequent because it's a lot cheaper to have local people, you know, um, accessing the local communities uh, via an app. So, for example, if, you know, uh, one of the companies here is developing a project in Brazil, uh, they don't need to send people from Europe or from uh, the States. They can just uh, access the app and see, wait, who is the, you know, closest? Is there a, um, a technical uh, person or analyst that is close enough to the community to go there and interview? And sometimes they're like half an hour or an hour away. They go, they interview, they upload the data and voila, you know, in the same day you have the information instead of having to wait for months for the person to, you know, organize all the logistics and come to Brazil and increase the cost of that by, you know, 50000 to $100,000 per, per visit. So it makes uh, the data more recurrent, the data gathering more recurrent, cheaper, and uh, also more reliable because it's, it's, it's fresher. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and before, uh, I, I would, would also really love to turn to Raviv to tell us a little bit about your solution as well. I think specifically one issue that has been um, kind of talked about is the interoperability issues among different protocols and different technologies. Can you speak a little bit about how uh, Qubit and MRV Collective is hoping to address these concerns? Yeah, so the problem starts with all those different MRV technologies, building those private clouds and sending data in different formats, of course. Um, we are working together uh, with the Seller Foundation um, to bring uh, all that data, um, of course, on chain, all that MRV data, and then um, connect it using uh, what's known as the Ocean Protocol, which is a smart contract, to make sure that we can give credit, credit also for the ownership of this data. Um, totally agree with Luis that uh, part of the solution to the MRV problem is getting the community involved. Um, again, make sure that we can train the community on how to measure, report, and verify. So we don't need to fly people around. So I'm excited to hear about this kind of Uber-like uh, app. <clears throat> and then, of course, um, create, create, creating a record on-chain and using some of the latest in on-chain technologies, such as consensus-based, right? <clears throat> this is something, uh, if you're familiar with the Open Forest Protocol, they're doing this for forest. You can start using a consensus network to verify this data. So it's not really just one source of MRV data. It's a network of sources that can uh, build consensus around the verification of this MRV data. <clears throat> this is one solution. Um, two other features that we are now uh, implementing are selective disclosures. Right. Um, part of the problem we see working with big organizations, financial institutions, they hesitate to push all this private data, uh, put it, you know, on chain. Uh, you can then use selective disclosures. Uh, there are a few other chains that support uh, this. We can decide what you mint on chain and what you keep private. Of course, you can hash everything. So this is while maintaining full privacy of the data, which is another big concern in MRV. And then um, another feature we're looking to implement is known as a zero knowledge location. Think about all these endangered species, all this data that you don't really want to make public, but you still need to verify for the credits for your projects. Uh, there are some technologies, uh, cha chain technologies we can use today to make sure that we can still disclose the location, but this location um, stays private. So these are some of the solutions we are implementing. Thank you very much. Glad that we are digging deep into the data and into the details of this panel. Unfortunately, we don't have any time left, but I, I hope that we can continue this discussion because I see a lot of collaborative thread that we can pull from all of our respective organizations. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I think this is the safest audience to ever say that isn't the most satisfying thing in the world is like a good dashboard with clean data, 
Like there's nothing more satisfying than that. And imagining that to nature is just amazing for me. We want to take a little break from going to the next panel and say, well, the idea here is for you guys to make connections with the companies presenting. So either on your left of the screen or on the bottom left, you can find a hamburger menu, click view all companies and find the companies that you found interesting click on their logo and make an intro to them in order to reach out for a follow-up connection, um, which I think you'll find interesting. Um, with that in mind, if you have questions, you can ask on the comments over here and we can move to our next panel. Um, our next panel is moderated by Evan Karen. Evan is currently the head of investment at Weaver Stone Ventures. Uh, a part of Riverstone private equity and energy investment and infrastructure firm. Prior to that, Evan was the CEO of Clear, ClearTrace, a Web3 ESG management platform for tracking ammunition and environmental reporting. Evan serves uh, on the board of Our Power, a resiliency technology provider, and was on the board of MP2 Energy, now called uh, Shell Energy, if you know it. Evan brings 20 years of experience in complex commodity and derivative trading and risk management, um, which is, I think, the perfect person to lead our panel about financing and credit. So, Evan. Yeah, thanks, for, thanks for inviting uh, me to join today. It's exciting to hear uh, about all these companies that are working on, on the space. It's, uh, we're going to do quick intros, um, but the panel really is around financing and credit and identifying ways to bring project finance either non-traditional project finance uh, into the world of environmental assets, carbon credits, et cetera. And uh, we're going to identify ways to, to do that and, uh, and options to make that happen. So um, I'm going to just start from the top right here. Stenberg, can you start uh, with a quick 45-second introduction? Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Evan. Uh, I'm known as Stenberg from Denver. I've uh, come from project development side. The previous company I founded is called The Agronom. It managed million hectares in Central Eastern Europe, that's 2.4 million acres, and we turned farmers into regenerated farmers. In Neagonom, we went to farmers and told them that, hey, why don't you become environmentally friendly, just work for up to five years, then you can issue VERA certified credits, sell them and get paid. Absolutely terrible pitch, right? <laughs> but that's the state of the market, as many previous panelists uh, told before me. So yeah, we're disrupting this. We're basically creating the world's first truly liquid, uh, guaranteed buyer-seller, 24-7 price transparency, uh, carbon exchange uh, for carbon investments, and also enabling carbon investors to invest in diversified and different asset classes across all carbons with solid wealth up. Thank you. Um... Marcus, uh, you're next. Actually, sorry, Elena, you're next. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for having us, Evan. Um, so I'm Helena. I'm one of the co-founders of Spirals. Um, and we'll dive during this panel into why financing is super important. So I'm going to skip that part of the spiel. But um, how does Spirals help with financing carbon credits? We act kind of like a green bank that, rather than investing in oil and gas, deploys capital into natural resources. Um, however, the impact of a traditional bank ends when money is spent. Uh, imagine using your credit card at the corner store um, and your money now moves from the green bank uh, into the corner store's oil, oil and gas bank. In other words, you can only really make impact as your money is sitting idle. Um, with spirals, when you deposit a token, we mint you back a green token, which represents your deposit and we're one-to-one -one collateralized and non-custodial and you can withdraw your original deposited token anytime. Behind the scenes, we use DeFi to fund refi protocols, many of whom are actually here today. Uh, and the, the green token that's minted has the same ERC20 token standard as your original token, uh, which now actually unlocks a lot of utility, uh, such as you know, being able to use it in DeFi and in payments, integrating it into other dApps and protocols, which means that any project or protocol can now make a climate impact for the first time without spending money on going green, which we think um, unlocks a lot of potential down the line. Uh, today, we're deployed on Celo, Polygon, and ETH, and have a TVL of around 300K. Thanks. Awesome. And uh, Marcus? Thanks, Evan. And thanks to everyone at the Flory team for putting together this great event. I really enjoy it so far. Um, I'm introducing Mentor, a, a protocol on Celo for sustainable, stable assets. 
for every country in the world with um, stable assets in many different currencies. We want to enable end users in every country to make digital transactions. And for this, we provide uh, permissionless, transparent and sustainable stable assets. We've heard how important transparency is quite a lot today already. Um, also, the events of the last two weeks were proof again of how important full transparency um, and trustless assets are um, today. There are already three assets live on Mentor, currently called Celo Dollar, Celo Euro, and the Celo Real. And with the current spin-off of this Mentor team, we now have a dedicated team that wants to grow adoption, um, grow liquidity, add different new currencies like a Philippine peso, a Kenyan shilling, a Mexican peso. And we want to use um, many of the assets of the projects that presented here today as collateral for these stable assets as well. Um, so you can check out uh, mentor.org, chat us um, via here, this platform, or via chat.mentor.org. And I'm looking forward to the panel now. And uh, yeah, thanks. Great. Thanks, everyone, for, for introducing themselves and the companies. I think everyone here is obviously doing things that are going to help bridge the gap between traditional finance and traditional project finance and the future of Web3, blockchain-based finance and, infra and infrastructure. Um, this is really just a general question for the whole panel, but um, if anyone could can answer it, how are projects financed today uh, in the carbon space, right? In terms of like how, without a liquid forward market, maybe Stenberg, you can talk a little bit more about uh, liquid carbon markets, but how are, you know, traditional project finance, you have either a toll road or a, you know, a, a bridge or a, you know, a marina or a, an airport or a renewable project, and you have forward curves, you have bank um, underwriting tax equity or uh, putting on hedges, posting significant credit and collateral to get the projects financed. How are carbon projects financed today? And then how can, uh, you know, having access to liquidity in the kind of the pricing mechanism to lock in uh, gross margin uh, to get these project finance, how is that going to evolve with, with a blockchain uh, in, um, technology specifically? Yeah, uh, well, it's purely OTC market. There's no bright transparency. We internally call it WhatsApp driven market. Like uh, there's tons of o OTC marketplaces out there. CBL is the biggest one. Uh, ultimately, deals are done in WhatsApp <laughs> and like they are not true liquidity. You know, I mean, they, it is liquidity, but they're not liquid. So and that actually makes it super predatory towards new players because they don't know what they're getting into. I spoke with a UK farmer who proudly told me how he got 80 cents per tree. And when I ran the numbers for him, I was like, you got five dollars per CO2 ton. Those credits were sold off for like 20 to 30 half a year later because it's UK agroforestry. And it's this is what happens a lot. It's like those people on the ground who do the actual work can't only bennies on the dollar uh, because, you know, they don't know who to trust. They don't know where to get the actual market information. But and at the same time, it's also not uh, that rosy on the investor side, because like investors, you know, when they're doing this project financing and investing these credits, they're taking on a risk, uh, a delivery risk. Uh, in fact, most carbon projects over promise and under deliver. And, and this is uh, one issue for investors. Another is it's like I said, OTC market, if they want to rebalance portfolio, they need to go out there and sell. Uh, yeah. We are disrupting those issues, but I'll let others add points here as well. Yeah, if anyone else, anyone else, any has anything else to add to that? I think the uh, another question is really how can on-chain liquidity or on-chain financing uh, help you know prove you know potentially crowdsource investments, uh, bring institutional investors uh, to be able to support projects, be able to bring project developers to a, either a marketplace or. Uh, other ecosystem, like maybe uh, Marcus or Elena, you have uh, um, comments on kind of the how blockchain can help unlock some additional capital to these to these uh, projects. Yeah, I can I can jump in here. I mean, I think the first step, like I mean, Sunver mentioned it, is like right now it's all over the counter. Like just by making it transparent and accessible, you already unlock a lot of that. Um, if I understood your question correctly, and like that, I think is step one. Um, but I think doing so has to be done really, really carefully. I think we've seen stuff in on-chain carbon markets where, you know, you had mass amounts of consumer investment come in and they didn't really know what they were buying, right? Uh, and it's not to say that companies that are buying know what they're buying, uh, but at least there's a lot of checks and balances in place. 
Um, so as we think about moving all of this on train, ensuring the high quality is, I think, really, really important and making sure that we're protecting, you know, retail investors as we do so. I fully agree. I think ensuring quality, ensuring um, or improving transparency of all these transactions is extremely important. And I think we've mentioned this in, in every panel so far, that transparency is one key factor um, also in financing um, these things um, that, that can be improved by this technology. And I think also here, um, the technology, I mean, still has to evolve in that sense that we will see in future, hopefully more liquid markets. We will have uh, forward markets. We have more efficient um, lending markets. We have uh, lending markets in different currencies, not everything based on um, on the dollar because we have projects in every country um, of the world. And, and I think here um, there's still a lot that, that has to be developed so that, that we can really um, yeah, make use of the whole potential of, of the technology. And Marcus, yeah. you were you were talking about the different currencies, and I think in your in your uh, in explaining what your company does, you were talking about using uh, developer projects uh, to back uh, reserve currencies or to back stable coins. How do you see that evolving? Right? How do you see you know kind of the the least degrees, if you will, or the life to death of a project of a project developer bringing a project on a platform? Uh, monetizing the credits and then using the the net asset value of that project, the offtake of the carbon credits to to back either a yield yielding based um, uh, asset or actually have like a net asset value that can be used to to back a um, a currency. Yes, yeah, so it's a very good question, and and um, what we what we are building with Mento is basically a platform that that is able to create stable assets that can do both, that can have like yield um, bearing assets or all other types of assets as um, collateral. Um, and uh, I think this has two really interesting features to use these types of assets also as collateral. One feature is obviously um, the nice thing around this story that uh, nature-backed assets, more demand for the stable assets leads to more demand of the regenerative asset and therefore it has a positive effect on the whole environment. The second part of the story is um, diversification. Um, if um, we back um, stable assets or less volatile assets, not only with other crypto assets that are highly volatile, but also with with nature that is maybe also volatile, but follows a different different risk factors. Then we can really have a diversification in in the collateral, and and therefore I think it's really interesting um, that that all this space is now um, evolving so quickly. Yeah, I agree. I think you know basically currencies based off nature based solutions. Uh, and be, be creating like environmental based currencies with long duration could be extremely helpful for low vol environments, uh, for more stability and uh, to enable, uh, yield, you know, potentially yield generating assets that are, you know, counter cyclical, they have a negative correlation to stock market and uh, provide a, you know, potentially an inflation hedge. So um, really kind of the question, um, you know, other questions that we had on the panel is really kind of this whole concept of DeFi uh, and and kind of opening up financing opportunities in the refi space. What what tools do you see in the traditional DeFi space that could be applied to uh, finance, and how do we bridge the gap between uh, from an education perspective of what what are people investing in? What are they what do they actually own? Right. I think those are kind of the the key questions coming out of some of the the recent you know world in general is that, you know, you're, these are real world assets, they're environmental assets, they represent a stake in, uh, you know, in a project, project development, how do we, you know, how do we demystify some of the DeFi to get the general public or the retail investor to start participating and seeing environmental assets as an asset class so they can, so they can actually fund and sponsor projects. Yeah, I, I, I'd actually like to also add to the previous point, which we talked a lot about transparency and like, uh, but one thing that wasn't mentioned that's, I think, incredibly important that blockchain enables is the massive amounts of interoperability. And, you know, Mento already mentioned stable points, but once you have liquid and uh, reliable carbon projects on chain, you can also have derivatives like options and futures and make them all leverageable against each other. And I think that's also the path to success with traditional players, because as they see real world, like classical financial markets starting to build on carbon markets and they're being matured, 
then basically this shows them that, wow, this is actually, you know, everything that we see on traditional finance, they managed to do the same thing on the blockchain world. And, uh, and like we can start, you know, leveraging our previous knowledge and apply this on all these derivatives, uh, stable coins and yield bearing assets. And uh, the bankers, the hedge funds, all these creditors, they will come in because they want to get their hands on these yields. And I believe that this is also the first step into the real world application of the blockchain, basically. Uh, carbon credits, I think, are the first and the best prime example of that. Great. Um... And then the, the, the real kind of, you know, I think there's probably not much time for maybe one or two other questions, but um, the question around credit and traditional infrastructure, when, I, you know, when I'm building a, a battery, uh, you know, I have to post margin, right? I have to, I ha if I want to hedge futures, and this maybe is a question around, uh, around bu uh, buffer pools or insurance pools, uh, when you're backing projects and whether it's the sponsor or you, there's a secondary market, uh, how, do you, how do you think about collateral and credit management when you talk about underfunded uh, or, um, you know, resources that are underperforming versus expectations uh, and, and really having damages associated with non-performance. How do you think about that in the, in the market? Yep. Uh, in our case, uh, we think that like guaranteeing delivery on chain and making sure that the risk is as minimized as possible for any investor is like the number one uh, objective for ed any uh, blockchain project that tries to bring carbon credits on chain. In case of forward investments, for example, we hired the entire team that has ex postdoc from Indian Institute of Technology. They worked in B0. They have a half a decade of like uh, forest and mangrove prediction modeling uh, to conservatively predict production. They're giving out this information for investors for free as a public good. And I think anybody else trying to bring forwards on chain uh, or even spot, it's like, you know, creating like end to end transparency and making sure that those guys that uh, are holding the assets on chain don't have to take the fall in case there's a failure is the number one priority. Uh, they can't be like uh, suddenly under collateralized. They need to use insurances. They need to use buffer pools and all the stuff like that. And then this is a question for Elena and, and Marcus. How do you think about... Uh, project selection, you know, when you talk about the the protocol and, and when you talk about, you know, the spirals protocol and really around which assets end up in the stable, uh, in the reserve, how do you differentiate one asset from another, whether it's, you know, an offshore project, a mangrove project, an environmental asset, what about assets that don't have carbon as their base currency? Yeah, I, I know we're at time here, so I'll keep it super short. Um, we do a combination of like, you know, having experts actually vetting things. Uh, we don't just plug into any tokenized natural assets. So we're vetting the actual methodologies and um, whether or not the projects are following those. Um, but then in terms of looking at like plastics, in addition to carbon, we do take a very like holistic approach um, where it's expertly vetted, but then our community ends up deciding kind of the allocation across the projects. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm going to wrap us up. I say um, thank you guys. Thank you, Evan. Thank you to the team we just presented. This was um, wonderful for me and, and actually is a DeFi person. This, this thing talked exactly about my personal intersection that I'm very in love with. Our next, uh, last but not least panel is talking about the journey from supply to retirement as in the end the goal of all of this is to retire those assets it's going to be moderated by lorenzo rota um who started her career is uh, building businesses with positive uh, social and environmental impact she's a consultant and co-founder of the crypto research and design lab uh, which produce evidence-based work on the potential impact of new technologies. She advises startups in the climate tech and sustainability sector and teaches at the University of Texas Center of, uh, for Integrate Design. She's co-chairing uh, a World of Economic Forum working group on the carbon and credits that will generate an industry-wide recommendation for the util utilization of blockchain. Um, with that, I would say that I met her about a few days ago, and for me, it was like, we are going to be friends forever. So I'm very excited to move the conversation from me to Lauren and from Lauren to the team.
Thank you so much, Tomer and the um, Flory team for having me. Uh, I don't need to say some of the things I intended to say about the demand for the voluntary markets, um, car carbon markets, because they've already been said. Um, but beyond that, we're going to see increased requirements from regulators, such as extended producer responsibility, which will provide opportunities for other ecosystem service credits, which is really exciting. It's easy to forget that retirement, though, which is a critical feature of all of these credits, is more than an accounting activity. It's actually intended as the moment an action has a direct environmental impact. Internally, organizations developing frameworks to determine how they how and what they will purchase um, is, is maturing. So the buy side is getting a lot smarter, um, but they're having a hard time because the market's not making it easy for them. I think we've heard a lot about that in the past hour. We see immense demand for all of these credits coming online. It's difficult to pull them down, um, to pin them down. And so we see um, energy going directly into participation of projects rather than engaging in and helping mature an open market. So we're gonna talk about the supply side's need to orient towards buyers, specifically their need to understand what is being purchased have visibility into the supply chain and actually trust a product's underlying attributes. And this includes a clear and compelling story of how, when, and where a credit is making a sustained climate impact. So I'm really excited to have um, three folks representing three different organizations that are addressing these topics specifically and working to build more functional carbon and environmental asset markets. So Andre, um, owner and Will, thank you so much. And I'll let you introduce yourselves and your respective organizations. Cool, Mark first. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, cool, yeah, so uh, I'm Will. I'm one of the co-founders of Stability, tracing carbon back to its roots. Uh, we're tackling the exact issue that Lauren just mentioned, the fact that demand is increasing for something that's risky and difficult to pin down, which is the state of the current, uh, carbon offsets at the moment. So our platform, Carbon Track, creates trust and transparency in carbon offsets, which in turn will incentivize more businesses and individuals to buy them. This, along with improving project verification and approval that we've already heard panelists talk about, is the lead domino that will lead to more farmers and landowners planting carbon capturing natural assets, essential if we're to remove the 10 gigatons of carbon by 2050. We're working with partners, including Worldline, the global payments provider, HS2 Rail Project, uh, and Mars on the Hope Reef Regeneration Project, using different features of our unique technology to enable them to meet their carbon negative goals. The combination of increased trust that we provide along with the reduced barriers will increase supply and allow more businesses to offset completely, reducing the amount of carbon entering our atmosphere and ultimately removing more than we're producing. We're currently raising. I would love to speak to similarly minded investors. Thank you very much. Thanks, Will. Please, Andre. Thank you, uh, Lauren. Uh, my name is Andre Van Robin. I'm CEO and founder of uh, Plastics. Plastics is a green tech startup that has developed the world's first sustainable uh, marketplace for sustainable NFTs. Our mission is to fight global plastic pollution. The plastics marketplace improves plastic recovery and recycling rates, connecting companies and individuals with plastic recovery projects across the world, especially in emerging and developing countries where pollution is most difficult to manage. We are operating in India, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Tanzania, Costa Rica, uh, Egypt, uh, Kenya, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Colombia, Mexico, California, France, and Spain. And uh, we are located out of uh, Barcelona. Thank you. Awesome. So hello, everyone. Great to be here. I am Onur, CEO and co-founder of Covalent Climate Tech. Covalent is a building. Uh, Co Covalent is building a blockchain-based registry for engineered carbon removal. Carbon removal companies issue, transfer, and retire credits on the blockchain by our registry. We are empowering carbon removal companies to build a single source of truth for their future credits and enabling them to sell credits with future vintages to get the funds they need to scale their technology. On top of the transactional layer we provide, we are developing a quality standard in collaboration with universities and various stakeholders from carbon removal ecosystem. By working together with a global independent verification organization, we will certify the quality of future credits so that buyers can build trust to invest in carbon removal companies at their early stages and then buy future credits. We already issued over a million credits on our registry and we are currently raising our pre-seed round. So if you are interested in, please feel free to reach out. 
Thank you, owner Andre and Will. And um, we have such a diversity of things to talk about, so I'm gonna try to cover them all. Um, but first, this came up a little bit earlier on with some of the other organizations that have been featured here. We talked about other types of credits aside from, aside from carbon that are increasingly important in fighting climate change and supporting planetary health. So Andre, um, specifically what you're doing, um, would love to hear what's happening outside of carbon to create funding in, for environmental impact using blockchain and how that's supporting you in the work with plastics. Thank you, uh, Lauren. Well, the, the fact of the matter is, is that the waste management industry is uh, only generating income uh, two ways, uh, collecting waste. And the second one is sorting and uh, selling that uh, waste as a feedstock to the recycling industry. So what we have created is a ability to have a third revenue source by selling the data related to the activity uh, of recovering plastic. And the data that they're selling is essentially the invoices that they're generating in the course of their activity uh, of selling that waste to the recycling industry. So eff effectively, we're providing them with the ability to create plastic recovery guarantees, very similar to your world of the plastic of the carbon credits. However, uh, our plastic recovery guarantees essentially are uh, confirming that the waste is going back into the recycling industry. Who's buying this? Uh, well, uh, companies and individuals. Companies mostly are buying it for two major reasons. The first one is to be able to uh, offset their plastic uh, footprint. Uh, and the second one is, most importantly, to sponsor waste recovery projects to reduce plastic into the environment. And this is what the NFT business model has done, because ultimately everybody says they want to save the world, but nobody's willing to pay for it. So by having uh, basically a model where companies can benefit uh, financially, economically from proving their commitment to the environment, and waste recovery projects can get funded uh, more than just selling their physical waste, you're creating a, a ecosystem that is a win-win, not only from a sustainability of uh, environment point of view, but from an economics point of view. And this is really interesting for those who aren't familiar as much with waste management. Um, there's also regulation, um, a lot of places in the, the US, other places in North America, like Canada and in Europe, um, called extended producer responsibility that are actually regulating um, introduction of things like single use plastics. And so these could, you can imagine how important these are going to be um, in reporting on that as well. So that, that's really um, exciting and, um, and, and a good addition and expansion of these particular types of technologies and their application in this space. Um, we're specifically here to talk about retirement, which that is, I mean, that's kind of retirement rebirth um, and, and supply chain tracking for, um, for um, non-virgin plastic. Um, but want to talk about like where there's room for improvement. We talked a lot about the, the MRV side earlier, a lot about origination. Um, specifically wanted to talk a little bit more about what that means from a full life cycle perspective and, and in retirement. So, Will, I would like to start with you and just learn a little bit more about what Stability is doing to, to help with this. Cool. Thanks so much, Lauren. Yeah, so the problem that we set out to fix was a very personal one for us. It was a project that we we're involved with and we wanted to offset our carbon footprint in doing that. And when we went out to the market and we started to look at what you could buy, uh, we realized almost immediately that there's a complete lack of transparency about what sits behind these carbon offsets. So even if you're a business or individual with the best will in the world and you, got, you want to offset what you're doing, you can't be sure that when you pay for one, so you're offsetting an airline ticket, for example, where that money goes and if there actually is additionality, that is to say additional new carbon being extracted from the environment. Um, so that annoyed us uh, and we thought we'd put our heads together and see if we could do something about it. Um, and so that's really what we're trying to fix now is that is to say, well, if you buy an offset that has been through our platform carbon track, you can trace back right back to the project, not just the project, but the exact trees. And we go accurate down to the gram, actually down to the femtogram, which I think 20 decimal places. Um, but the idea is to be extremely granular in where that carbon uh, comes from. And then we track that. Uh, so not only the carbon, but all the verification data as well. Uh, and we're working on uh, improved verification methodologies that can speed up the verification process for projects. But take all of that information, put it into a token, and then use that across the life cycle of the asset. So any point in time, if you're buying one of these offsets that hasn't been retired, you can see exactly how much carbon sits behind it. And then if you do retire it, you can be sure that it's not already been retired against something else, for example. So we're trying to address a lot of the, the problems around double spending, um, lack of additionality um, and uh, yeah, fraud at times. 
And, and Will, when you when we spoke earlier, um, it's interesting because you talked a lot about the benefits from the project developer side, which are also massive. And so I wanted to make sure to touch on those. I, I'll just uh, attest to the fact that um, having worked with small project developers like Fungi, I know some of those folks are on this call, it can become, I think you said a $300,000 endeavor just to get started yeah. and take, you know, current yeah. protocols take 18 months to get to get through. Which so. is which is crazy. So the problem and offsets are multiple. There's this lack of transparency, but so that's one of the main reasons why um, companies and individuals aren't buying them. On the supply side, it's extremely difficult in the UK, at least, for farmers and landowners to get onto a carbon registry and begin trading their carbon. It's quite a closed knit community of sophisticated carbon traders and approximately £300,000 if you're a, a new project and you want to get on. Um, and coupled with an 18 month verification process, if it's Vera Gold Standard, that means that almost everyone doesn't do it. So working with our partners at Regeneration Earth, we've created the UK Carbon Code, which is, takes the best uh, and highest standard elements uh, of verification from Vera and Gold Standard and optimizes it for blockchain technology, reducing the verification process from 18 months down to three, while still maintaining a higher verification standard than those other standards. And we charge projects nothing. At the moment, I've re reserved the right to charge in the future, but no, um, at the moment we charge nothing. So the idea is that we remove those barriers of entry for farmers and landowners. And we have a huge network of them now signed up to working with us across the UK. Um, and uh, yeah, as so that basically guarantees a good supply chain of good quality carbon in the future. That's great, thank you. And, and, and Onar, you're doing something very similar for the engineered side, which I was very happy to hear in creating this ecosystem of kind of transparency and ease for, for new tech-based projects to come online. Can you talk a bit about what you're doing? Sure, of course. So we are building a methodology agnostic registry where carbon removal companies either build their own methodologies or they can use whatever available in the market. But most importantly, we are creating like a minimum threshold for the quality of sequestered carbon so that buyers uh, build conviction to invest in carbon removal companies at the early stages, which is kind of chicken and egg problem in the market today. At the early stages, carbon removal companies are not able to build trust around their credits and they cannot access the funds they need to scale uh, their technology. Therefore, with the, with the quality standards, we are aiming to solve this problem. And most importantly, by certifying future credits, obviously we're providing full transparency and traceability since the, uh, since the beginning of the, of, the, of the carbon removal life cycle. So certifying future removals and then once carbon removals are delivered, fulfilled, implementing the digital MRV solutions on our registry. So we, we provide full transparency and traceability and trust along, along the way till the, the verification of the carbon removal credit after, after the fulfillment occurs. This is so, so exciting. So actually making it accessible for anybody who wants to participate on the buy side to engage with small project developers. This is such good news. Um, and to do it in a way that doesn't risk the reputation. Um, my last question for each of you and, and answer it quickly, because I know we're running out of time, um, is specifically when we think about um, what we're going to enable in terms of financing to come into the space and, and access to markets. You each had an, a unique perspective on that and what can happen through application of blockchain at this particular moment in time. So Andre, I'll have you go first just to talk a little bit about what that means for plastics. Well, for plastic, it means basically that any entrepreneur uh, who is in a developing nation and wants to be in the business of uh, waste recovery can uh, create their business plan uh, on the basis of selling NFTs, i.e. plastic recovery guarantees. And then by following our methodology, uh, which is uh, extremely uh, transparent and scalable, uh, they can access worldwide markets. And examples are in Egypt, we have customers uh, from Nile recovery projects uh, that are selling their plastic recovery guarantees to other Egyptian companies. We have customers in Kenya who are selling their plastic recovery guarantees to customers in Spain. We have Thai uh, waste recovery projects uh, selling their plastic recovery guarantees to customers in the UK. So having access to this uh, funding uh, in a uh, very transparent, smooth and verifiable way is what the NFT business model uh, has enabled uh, in the business of waste management. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andre. Well. I'll be very quick. Yeah, so our model on the um, on the consumer side is we do live transactional offsetting and particularly targeting small emissions where you can make higher margins. So laptop emissions, 22 grams an hour at home working, payment transactions, we can do live fractionalized offsetting. And because the margins are bigger when you target smaller amounts, 
we can share those revenue streams with our partners. So either creating a new revenue stream for them or uh, it's cost them nothing to be carbon neutral. That way on the um, on the buy side, we're removing barriers to businesses actually financing and getting involved in this by taking it as a cost off their balance sheet and actually making it an asset. Done. Thank you. That was very quick. And owner, last but not least, tell us a little bit about what you're getting access to through blockchain. Sure. So through Covalent, uh, carbonable companies can sell even a single credit with future vintage to an individual. So this is not available today in the market. So we are empowering carbon mold ecosystem to be able to connect and transact with every type of businesses and every type of stakeholders, which is going to help scaling carbon removal a lot, which we see critical to fix climate change. That's fantastic. And I said this earlier, one of the first times I've heard anybody talk about actual retirement related to futures or forwards. And so that's really exciting that that's first and forefront for, for what you guys are doing. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you again to the Floyd crew. Thank you, thank so much, you Laura. Laura. Thank, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, everybody. I have to say <clears throat> something on a personal note. This event touched me um, on a personal level, seeing so many people excited on impact. If it's investors that we've seen, if it's companies that they're building, if it's people who came out of pure interests. So thank you, everybody, for coming. And I'll pass to Ryan in that sense to prep it up. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tomer. And, and thanks, everyone, for coming. I, I, we had such great engagement and just like amazing amount of information um, in the panels. Like it was, you just couldn't stop listening. Um, and uh, the whole the whole purpose of this event really is to, to let you guys connect with these founders. Um, they're at the forefront of building uh, the new solutions um, that we need to, to combat climate change. Um, so please, if you didn't have a chance while you're engaged in listening to the panels, um, feel free to connect here. Um, you, you know how to click on the company's pages. You can just make, make an introduction there. Um, those pages will be up for the next week uh, via the, the event link. So you can always come back and browse through, uh, learn more about what the companies are doing and, and get in touch with them. Um, and we'll get recordings out um, that will be there as well of the event. So I um, just want to say thanks again, um, especially amazing, um, uh, our amazing guest moderators, Anna, Tim, Hara, Evan, and Lauren. So great to have you guys here. You really brought um, such an amazing, uh, such great um, gravity to each panel. Um, and uh, one big shout out to the Stonks team for putting this on so smoothly. Um, they're all behind the scenes, but uh, if you guys are, anyone in the audience is hosting an event, um, reach out to Stonks. They, they do an amazing job here. Um, and we'll see you at our next event. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.